It's time for another comic book retrospective. This time we're going to Marvel Comics and perhaps the most tragic hero in the history of comic books themselves, The Incredible Hulk, issue number 171, titled Revenge. And here with me is the comic book retrospective crew. We've got award-winning editor, comic book writer, Joe Corrala. How you doing, Joe? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I am doing absolutely fantastic. We've also got the voice of the voiceless, the man so cool they call him the Breed, the comic book hoarder himself. Eric Breed, how you doing? Not bad. Well, baseball season's on, so at least you got stuff to do during the day besides read comic books. But we had you read an absolutely fantastic comic from January 1974. Check out this creative team. Steve Englehart, Jerry Conway co-writing Herb Trimpey on art. This thing looks absolutely fantastic. What a fantastic one-shot story. This thing is absolutely exhilarating from beginning to end. Joe, I believe you picked this one out. Why was it that we needed to read Incredible Hulk 171? Uh, we, we needed to read a, a Hulk comic with Herb on the art because we have not done that yet. And uh, for a lot of people, he's still like the standard bearer of, of Hulk and, and what people think of Hulk to this day. It involves two great villains. It's a nice villain team up with, um, you know, Abomination and Rhino. And this issue, while it is self-contained, shows a lot of other plot threads going on. And I think a lot of people who haven't read this era of Hulk, if you've never gone before Peter David's Hulk, think that it's this like mess of like silly, like sort of one and done stories. And that, you know, Peter David was like the first person to really get that book whipped into shape. And while his run is incredible, and I am not knocking Peter David at all. There were a lot of interesting things and plot threads going on before that. And I, I think that people deserve to take a look at it. You make a really good point there. That's something I wanted to stress. Like how this is a one-shot story, but it's so much bigger than that because we're talking about years of story that are being connected by this one issue. Specifically, Breen, everyone at this point that's reading Incredible Hulk at the time believes that Betty's uh, wh- husband, Glenn Talbot, is actually dead after he was shot rescuing her father, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt Ross, in Incredible Hulk 166. But he's really alive at this time, and he's a prisoner, but that's not going to be revealed until Incredible Hulk 187. So we're talking like at least two years of storyline just with that. Yeah, and we're also you know getting Betty and her father back together. Betty had just spent a couple issues as a giant green harpy. So there was always a lot of stuff going on in the background of the Hulk that a lot of times the Hulk was just kind of a a background. He would sometimes fade into the background of his own book because there was so much going on. He was the central thread that brought them all together. But again, this this is from a time when comic books had expansive supporting casts that kept the book running. And this in the Hulk was no exception. We also get another wonderful plot thread that's that's essentially coming together from Incredible Hulk 158 and 159, and that is when Hulk bested Abomination and Rhino together, Joe, and they're seeking, you know, essentially their revenge in this, so it all makes sense. It's not coming out of nowhere. This is all all carefully constructed and comes together in this nice, really great package. So speaking of the Herb Trippy art, we get into Incredible Hulk 171, Revenge, and we start out with this amazing opening shot, Joe, Essentially, on the Hulk's face, we realize or we find out that he's actually on a plate. He's sitting in a box. But the amount of emotion and the and the quality of the illustration on the on the face of the Hulk at this point is of such high quality. I couldn't believe it. It was just you open it up, page one, mind blow. And and the title, Revenge, the way it's all you know etched out there, and with the big exclamation point. You know, Artie Simic, who was one of the uh, early letters, you know, there from the beginning of the Marvel Age of Comics you know, doing the lettering. So yeah, really great stuff. And this is during the, you know, Roy Thomas era of of Marvel. Absolutely fantastic. We get some more uh, information here, Breen, and I thought this was somewhat funny. When they give you the reveal that he's actually in a crate, he's kind of sitting there by himself. He's all lowly. He doesn't know why he's there. You kind of feel bad for him, but it's also kind of got a little bit of a chuckle the way that it was presented. I thought that was funny. Yeah, he can't, he can't remember why he's in there. And then he goes, oh yeah, Betty's here. Betty's Hulk's friend. That's why Hulk is here. He goes, why is it so hard for Hulk to think? Because <laughs> like when, when the when Armbrister starts getting a little belligerent with Betty, he goes, should Hulk come, you know come out and help her? And that guy, it's just this. Ver- I mean, I I prefer the Peter David version myself, but this version 
I always would would look for traces of intelligence in this version of the Hulk, and you always got a couple of things that, yeah, he's a little smarter than than you think. Yeah, because like I said he he stayed in the box. He yeah, I said it, that that that's a good little scene when he comes out. He has no idea where he is, and then he realizes I'm starving. I got to find something to eat. That kind of gets us into this this uh, big scene where they uh, land at the Hulkbuster base. Thunderbolt Ross has shown up ahead of time. They're going to get the reunion of the father and the daughter. You know, he was captured and he was freed. Yeah. And they're starting to notice that there's something wrong with the base. Everyone's gone. They're like, where's all the equipment? It's been sabotaged. We've got Bruce Banner essentially escaping out. He's like, I need to get something to eat. And people are starting to notice that something is wrong. And then you get the first hints that it's actually abomination. And Rhino are sitting waiting because they want to destroy Hulk. I thought it was really well set up. We got a nice uh, emotional moment between the father and the daughter. And it gets you right into the story. Yeah, and that moment with uh, Thunderbolt Ross and his daughter Betty, like they they build up to it really well of how's this going to go, and then it ends up being a really nice, sweet moment. And it, you know, that's a nice little misdirection because they're really setting up Betty to kind of be like, I don't know if she's going to be able to deal with her father at this point. But once she finally sees him, you, you know, all of that sort of washes away, and she's just happy to be with her dad again. And and just like you were saying, you know, you see, um, what was it? We get banner back um being confused and then we get just sort of like the legs of legs, abomination yes. rhino before we get to explosive action pretty quick you know we see a, a plane get just demolished you know people flying around with all sorts of shooms and screams scattered about the page and, and then we get uh, this amazing splash page of Rhino charging with Abomination, you know, just holding a tank. It's a gorgeous page, and it shows, it, it really establishes how intimidating these characters are. It should be a poster, and I want it on my wall, because it's absolutely one of the, the standout page probably of this comic book. But this is like a really cool scene here, Bree, because Abomination and Rhino are unopposed here. They essentially take everything over. They imprison everybody. And next thing you know, the whole base is surrounded by all these military troops as we see that I think it's uh, Sam Wilson's nephew is is traveling in to meet his good friend Thunderbolt Ross. And my favorite part maybe of the comic book is Bruce Banner wakes up. He's been sleeping the whole time. They've taken over the whole base. They've blown everything up, but he's taken a, you know, he's been sleeping for 12 hours because he was the Hulk or whatever. And he's completely confused. And Jim Wilson and his girlfriend's with him, and they turn away. But that's not going to stop him because he's got to get onto the base to be a part of the story. I thought it was a really good setup for this big conflict that you're going to have. And they've kind of put all the pieces in place to ratchet up the tension and, and get the conflict moving. Well, a couple of things. One thing, yeah, we, we, we can't gloss over. Thunderbolt Ross can take a punch because he <laughs> takes one from the abomination now, let's off. be honest, that what? should be the end of Thunderbolt Ross. <laughs> but he gets back up. <laughs> and I think we see, and I don't know if it was the Abomination's influence, but this is a far more homicidal rhino than we'd ever seen before. As we're going to find out what their true motivation is, what they're, how far they're willing to go to achieve their ends. And he has no problem taking Betty as a hostage. You know, up to this point, you know that both of these characters had been in several conflicts with the Hulk, but this is a darker version of either one of them than we've ever seen. And we see Bruce Banner; he, he wakes up. He's got to see what the hell's going on, and he finally finds the cell, the Hulkbuster cell that's holding Thunderbolt Ross, that's holding Arm Brewster, that's holding uh, Betty. And he's like, "What the hell's going on?" Next thing you know, right behind him shows up. I believe it's Abomination, and we know that the Hulk is finally going to come out. And we get this really good conflict. But at the same time, we've got this gamble bomb that's a real threat to everybody, Joe. And obviously, Hulk is not going to be able to defuse a gamble bomb. And certainly, Thunderbolt Ross isn't going to be able to do it. Our Bruce is not going to be able to do it. They're imprisoned. So we see Jim Wilson has actually contacted Thunderbolt Ross, and he sends him on this quick quest where he's got to essentially defuse this bomb before it destroys everybody. Jim Wilson's a really interesting character. He was um, sort of the replacement for Rick Jones as Rick Jones went on to sort of be the insert character for the reader in multiple comics. He was, you know, he just got kind of got tossed around being not just uh, with the Avengers, but kind of being everyone's sidekick at one point or another. <laughs> he just really got passed around a lot. So, you know, you, they developed this character, you know, created by Herb and uh, Roy Thomas, uh, Jim Wilson, 
who is also revealed later on to be, you know, Sam Wilson's uh, nephew, to be that character that they need in these sort of stories to be like, oh, the Hulk's busy punching everyone and, you know, we need someone to go in and, you know, solve a little puzzle to to finish off the story. So, so this is where he comes in with, you know, his girlfriend, uh, Talia, not that Talia, to, uh, you know, figure out how they're going to stop him. And um, this is a man who's willing to use his girlfriend as bait to save everyone. absolutely and she she protests she's like i'm not doing that he's like listen woman you're doing it for to save the world you're gonna you're gonna be bait for abomination and uh and rhino i thought it was fantastic it's great and uh she she really puts herself in some danger there it's like i just run past them and uh let's hope they bicker for a minute so they don't just immediately grab you <laughs> but that allows him to kind of free everybody, him being uh, Jim Wilson. And we finally get the big confrontation between the monsters, Brady. This is what we've all been waiting for. Hulk versus Rido versus Abomination. But there is some Hulkbuster equipment on the villains this time. So they've dialed up the intensity. They dialed up the stakes and the danger that they present to Hulk. He recognized him like, didn't I already beat you up? All right, I'm going to do it again. And we have a nice little confrontation. I love the way it ends, though. The way that it ends is absolutely brilliant, Breed. He finally goes, you know what? Jib told me that I need to stall for time. I've done enough time. I'm leaving. He walks away, and the two monsters run into each other and knock each other out. <laughs> well, yeah, he, but he does, when he says he's tired of waiting, he does get a couple shots in first. As formidable as the Rhino and the Abomination are, we do find out that the one mistake they made was they forgot to cut off communication to where Thunderbolt Ross was imprisoned because if Jim couldn't have reached him, he wouldn't have known how to defuse the gamma bomb. Everybody goes, boom, there's no Hulk 172. You know, I said he gets his couple shots in, and then he just goes, yeah, I'm out. Later. <laughs> and then, <laughs> what, a, what a perfect way for the Abomination and Rhino to take themselves out. Oh, yeah. I was <laughs> I had a huge smile. Let's put it that way. I thought it was fantastic. The art was good, and it felt so so good for this kind of version of Hulk. Where he, he wins in the end, but it was because he was tired of fighting and, and, and he didn't want to be a part of it anymore. There is a double cross here at the end, Joe, which I thought was just was terrible. We see right. Hulk is kind of getting interviewed by the press and he's like, get the stick out of my face or I'm going to like break it or something like that. Oh, and yeah. the next thing so, you know, they throw like a cage on him. And even Thunderbolt Ross is like, oh, Brewster, what the fuck, man? You can't be doing this. He just saved the day. He's like, I'm doing my job. I'm a patriot. And they've imprisoned the Hulk in the last page. I was like, they did him dirty here, Joe. They not only did him dirty, and you're reading this and going, what happens next? And then they drop in the next issue, the Juggernaut shows up. He's fighting all the powerhouses in the Marvel Comics universe. Yeah, pretty crazy. And, and this is during that time where there were no X-Men titles. The X-Men were just kind of scattered about and would show up in, you know, Cap and some other books. If, if you'd been reading Hulk up to this point, this was basically the first time that Ross acknowledged that maybe he's been going about it wrong the whole time, and they yeah. shake hands. That had never happened. And then, of course, he's betrayed two panels later. Oh, and with the Hulk's bitch. mind, he's not going to process that Ross wasn't in on it. So it, it, it all got undone by Arm Brewster's actions, as we find out in subsequent issues. And yeah. That you know, I said Ross and you know the Hulk really never did. This is as close as they really ever came to coming to cross purposes. Now, if you want to get this, obviously, I said it's part of a bigger story. You can get the reprints, Brent Breen. How do you have this? Do you have the single issue? Do you have it in an omnibus? Uh, epic yeah. collection. Yeah, epic collection that, that this is right in the middle of. And in fact, I'm act I was actually reading this when Joe picked that, <laughs> so I had to jump forward a couple issues. But uh, <laughs> yeah, there's. There's an unbelievable amount of great stories in this book and just great characters. I said, yeah, you get you get three of the heaviest hitting villains in the Marvel universe in two issues. Yeah, this yeah. one that we did in 172. Now, and, Joe, you are the king of the omnibuses. Is there an omnibus out there that they need to get? Or is there some some other type of reprint that they need to find? This you one? know, I I went with the uh, Folio Society uh, Hulk uh, collection, which which I showed off to you all. The yes, other week, that thing is absolutely beautiful, but that is a top dollar collection. It if is you like Hulk collection. and you want to throw a little bit of money out there, I would suggest that thing because it does look beautiful. This is beautiful. Um, the way you know Breen's reading it with the epic collections, I love the epic line. I I have 
quite I went from having none of them like a couple of years ago to having what most people would probably say is too many, but it's, <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, it's, it's like, um, I, I, ha I still have more omnibuses than uh, Epic Collections, which is probably a problem, but... Uh, it's only on moving day. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, um, you know, it's available. It's a great story that's out there. Definitely recommend sh people checking out that earlier stuff. You might still prefer Peter David's run, and that is completely fine. No one's saying, you know, this has to be the greatest thing, but these are incredible stories that are really worth people's time. I know you'll be shocked to hear this, but this isn't the only Incredible Hulk issue that we've ever done here on The Retrospective. In fact, we did an entire story, essentially where a Hulk arrives in New York, he ends up destroying the city and fighting a bunch of heroes in there. This is an absolutely fantastic story. It's a little bit of a longer video, but this is like three or four issues of Top Flight, Incredible Hulk action. If you haven't seen this, definitely check it out.